Welcome and thank you for tuning in to our broadcast online. We've made it available for you so you could be a part of the TKC family. As you're watching this message, share it, subscribe to the Kingdom Church page. It will be a blessing to you. We look forward to connecting with you soon live in the sanctuary. Make sure you support the ministry, take an opportunity, text to give. It's so important that we're able to provide this ministry outlet to you. Let's get into the word. Uh, I want you to turn to Luke chapter number 10, verse 25. Luke chapter number 10, verse 25. If you're looking for some good reads this year, I encourage you to um, um, read this wonderful book that um, I have. It's called Replenish. It's called Replenish. I'll get you the author um, later, but it's called Replenish. Um, so it's like a devotional. It's, it's, a cinem- it's, it's probably one of the greatest books that has been written, and I encourage you to get it. Luke 10, verse 25, it says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stooped up, stood up to the test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul all your strength, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus answered, very important, follow this. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and he went away leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Ceremonially, he was considered to be unclean. So to a Levite, a Levite is just a worship leader, a singer in the local church. When he came to the place and saw him, passed on, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, somebody who you wouldn't see uh, mingling together, but a Samaritan as he traveled came where The man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil on his wine, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. Somebody say his own. Say it like you got life. Say his own. And brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper, looked after him and said, when I return, I will reimburse you for an extra expense you may have. Which three of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robber? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. This morning, my word for my personal word for, the, for this year is, is production and profit. Production and profit. That's, that's my word for the year. Production and profit is two words. Um, but I want you to have a word for the year. What is your word for the year? That's, that's what needs to guide you. Production and profit. If it's not profitable, if it's not productive for me, I don't want to waste my time doing it. Because there's a lot of times I found last year uh, I was engaged in things that were not productive and they were not profitable. I left there losing time, effort, and energy, and it wasn't productive and it wasn't profitable. So that's, that's my thing for this year. Uh, but, but the word that I want to use for the church this year is a simple C word. It's the word called commitment. Somebody say commitment. Commitment. It's, it's a word called commitment. It's commitment to go to church commitment to be a part of the local church, commitment to be involved in the local church. But the worst thing to do is being a part of something that you don't even know what it is. And so this morning, I'm not, my job is not to really try to preach hard or whatever. It is just to really communicate uh, where we want to be in this next year. And so here it is. There, there's uh, the task of starting a new year is always needed to set the proper perspective and posture. It is my aim to ensure we leave with one of the greatest gifts a leader can give you, and that gift is called clarity. Clarity on the essence of what clarity in the essence of what the church should resemble in our internet text message 160 character culture. Years ago, we developed a popular phraseology, what would Jesus do? WWWJD. It was a reminder and an insightful tool to communicate, or better yet, put Jesus in modern contemporary culture. Well, this morning, my subject title for all of us is this, the type of church Jesus would pastor. 
So I want to talk about for a little bit the type of church that Jesus would pastor from our sermon series, Where Do We Grow From Here? Where do we grow from here? A lot of us should be growing from our last year. A lot of us from, should be growing from our experiences. And so here it is, Jesus is talking to a man, and he says, listen, there's a man that was coming to a, a city called Jericho, and as he's walking down, the, you know, the story of the Good Samaritan, a lot of us have heard it. Let me give you a different twist from a church perspective. He says, I, I want you to be able to embrace this story from the context that there is a man walking down the hill and he gets jumped unexpectedly. Life happens to him unexpectedly. And now he is bruised and he is hurting, not because of anything that he has done, but because of what life has given to him. And the scriptures use a very profound, picturesque word. They say he's not dead, he's half dead. And that's very interesting because a lot of us, if we were to be honest, we're not dead, we're half dead. The church is supposed to be a place for half dead. And you might be saying, well, what are half dead people? Half dead people are people who had children and, and they ended up having children that go wayward. And all they want, they look through their family pictures and they think, man, I raised my child to be better than this and my child is out there doing crazy things or my child is incarcerated and I just feel like life has been taken from me. Or you've been married for 17 years. You are about to get to the 20-year mark and then you end up getting divorced and now your life is seemingly half dead. Or or you had all of this money, you made an investment and you lost $10,000 and now... You have that. You have this home that you've been a part of. You love this home. You decorated it yourself, and all of a sudden, it's foreclosed on because you can't pay for it anymore, and now you're half dead. Or you, or you may be a person. <laughs> you really were waiting on your tax return, and now it's held up, and you, you half dead. You, you just tripping right now. You like, I, Lord Jesus, if you don't, Lord, be a wall, be a fence, be something. I, I just need it because you have that. You need, you need. So there are circumstances and situations that cause us to feel half dead. Or, or you were victimized. You were, you were victimized. You were driving and all of a sudden you had a good record and now you got pulled over and then you got charged with something and you don't have enough money to fight it and you didn't have enough money to call Monique who is now with the, the, the state clerk and, 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 and now, now she can help you review convictions that are, that are false. They must be false though in order for her to help you review it and it's free. But here's the thing. You, you now have a charge and, and or you went out to a party and you, you drunk a little bit too much communion and, and then you, you got pulled over and now, now you got a DUI, your license is stripped from you and your whole world is stripped and now you're trying to catch Ubers to work and, and your life is half dead. Maybe you've been raped and, and you find yourself promiscu prom promiscuous because of what has happened to you in the past. It wasn't that you were looking for it. You just were walking down the street and all of a sudden you got surprised, you got jumped. Or maybe you're, you know, there's this big Art Kelly piece right now and, and maybe, maybe you were molested or maybe you were taken advantage of and now you're, your sexuality's half dead. You don't know if you're straight or if you're what. And so now you come to this place called the church which is supposed to be a hospital, a place where I can come half dead and you not perceive me to be nasty because I'm I'm bloody. The, the type of church that Jesus would, would pastor is a place where everybody is welcomed. Even the one that looks like they're happy on social media but really are dissatisfied with life because their virtual life is much better than their real life. half dead. You know what half dead is? You got a purse that got Louis on it or it's a coach or it's a Gucci, but your purse costs more than what you got in your bank account. It's called half dead. It's it's not it's not you're not alive. You got more month than you got money. It's like a half dead situation. You know how it is. You, you know, you're half half dead. I mean, half dead. The church is a hospital. It's supposed to be a place that everybody's welcomed, even the half dead. Even the challenge. But here's a scripture that's very important. Jesus says this, that it wasn't a Samaritan. It wasn't a Jew that helped him. It was a Samaritan. Which means this. Our faith should not only be 
anticipated or expectant of people that look just like us alone. So the, the, the hospital, the house, should be able to receive Samaritans, should be able to receive Jews. Jews are the natural dominant culture. Blacks are the natural dominant culture of Pine Hills. But it should not exclude us from receiving Samaritans. Because if you cannot receive all ethnicities, then you don't have a church, you have a club. And if you don't fit our club, you can't come in. You know, if you go to a gym and you don't have a membership and you try to scan your key, they won't let you in. Well, the church shouldn't be that way. We should be able to receive every single one. It does not mean you condone everybody's sin, but it does mean I got to at least let you get in to clean you before I kick you out. And I know we want to live in a culturalistic time where we want to say, no, I want, I want everybody to be righteous and 100% holy. Well, nobody is. Check your DM. Let's read your text messages on the screen. No, not the ones that you deleted. Not, no, 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 the ones you deleted. That, that's, that's, what, that's what we're talking about. So we're saying that God is a God that receives all of us rich, poor, tither, non-tither. He receives us all, but he doesn't want us to stay where we are. That's why we call our church a church where you can come as you are, but you won't stay as you are because the reality is, is that life will unexpectedly happen to all of us. We'll leave us half dead. And the worst thing to happen is if I'm half dead, and you're a priest, and you're someone that I'm supposed to count on, I don't want you to walk over me when you should be speaking to me. So I come to church, I've been missing for, for nine months, because typically that's what we do, because I got pregnant, and now I'm coming back after my baby is done. And, and now we, the first thing we say, well, where you been? You know how much courage it took me to get to this place? The church should be a hospital. It's like when you marry couples and you know they, don't, they couldn't stop hunching each other so they got married before time and they just did the wedding so that everybody could feel like they're really married and then as a pastor, you know, the trick is like, well, let me get your wedding certificate and they're like, oh, oh, huh, huh, I don't have it. Well, that's because you already got married. You know, this is just a, a, a after ceremony because you already did the ceremony. But we should be a place where we receive everybody. But here, here it is. But you still got to have a standard even though you receive everybody. And so here it is. My mama had a standard. Maybe your mama weren't like my mama. My mama had a standard. It didn't matter who you were, how many friends I had come over. She had this furniture that had all this plastic in it that nobody could go in. It didn't matter how many friends came over. They're like, uh-uh, you need to take your shoes off. Because when you, I don't care what you've done, but when you come in this house, you can come in, but you got to take your shoes off. You ain't just going to sit on my furniture with your clothes. Ain't nobody going to sit on this furniture. It is there for decoration. We went to rooms to go, spent $3,000 on this furniture, put plastic on it so that everybody knows that when you come in this house, we have a standard. And if you don't like the standard, you don't have to be here. But so here it is. There's a Samaritan. So here, here's what we want to do as a church. It's very simple. It's three E's. Our church is very based on this. Empowerment. Somebody say empowerment. empowerment. Encouragement. Encouragement. Enlightenment. Enlightenment. Here's what Jesus does. Number one, he enlightens the, the, the religious leaders spiritually. He says this. Let me give you a parable. Because church should enlighten you spiritually. Look, for example, you know how we talk about, oh, we got haters and all this and that, which is so over the top. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. You do know the people you hate, Jesus still loves. I just want to help you because it should be enlightening to you that the same person that you're praying that you want to be demised is the same child of God that God loves that you hate church should be enlightened so he tells them an enlightening thing because sometimes we are the greatest pharisees and we don't even realize it because we 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 as the church we oftentimes give out the law and then when we need grace we want the grace but we're good at giving others the law and giving ourselves grace when in actuality we should be giving others the same measure of grace that god has given unto us 
So he spiritually enlightens them. You do know spiritually being enlightened means that just because you pray, your body is still a conduit to which God flows through. So you cannot pray to God and then eat baby back ribs every single day. That is still part of your spiritual enlightenment. Because your spiritual needs, this is how I consume and care for the temple of God. Y'all didn't like that type of church. All right, I gotta, now I got to feel half the floor now because I'm losing all the people, right? So here it is, secondly. He encourages him by giving him a helping hand. You know, people don't need your critique. Sometimes they need your hand. Hey, you know you're bleeding. I know I'm bleeding. I need your encouragement. I need your encouragement. Help me. If you know that, that I, I'm doing it the wrong way, don't let me do it the wrong way and then watch me fall and then say, well, I knew I saw that coming a long time ago. Well, encouragement is give me a helping hand. You know how it is to have trials and tribulations. Give me a helping hand. Some of you have been through some half-dead situations. You lost a child. You know how it is. Why don't you rally around those who've had the same experience? Infertility. Why don't you rally around those who had the same experience? The problem is, is social media gets our testimony, but the church doesn't. You tell the world what you've been through, but you won't even tell your own brother and sister to help them get out of what they're in. Encouragement. Give people a helping hand. The man said, listen, I see you, I see you bleeding. Let me, let me do this. I'm going to take you. I'm going to put you in my car, in my donkey. You bleeding everywhere. They, and, and they didn't have cars back then. They had donkeys. And if you had a donkey, you had to be doing pretty decent. So let's modernize and contemporize it. We're going to put you in my new Audi. I'm going to put you in my new BMW. I'm going to put you in my new Camry. You got blood all over you. And I'm going to give you a helping hand because I understand that if God has blessed me, it is not just for me. It is to be a help to other people. So you mean to tell me God gave you a new car and can't nobody ride in it? Wait a minute. So God promoted you. Now you're making $70,000 a year and God can't get a piece of your money? You're making 50 grand now and you used to make 20 and now God can't get a percentage out of what he blessed you with? No, 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 God, I can't let you get, I got, I got plans, Lord, and I can't let you have, I can't lend you my stuff because it's mine. You do know that everything that you have is a lease. You're, you can, you, when you have a lease, you can drive it as much as you want. You can do whatever you want with it. But at the end of the term, you got to turn it back in. And so it is with your life. Your life is a lease. You don't own it. So you mean to tell me? You got homeless kids all around us, but y'all can't share a piece of your money? It's my hard-earned money. Well, if God takes his breath from you, how hard will it be? No, we got to be invested. Love is investment. Where there's no investment, there's no love. Where there's no investment, hear me. Where there is no investment, there is no love. If there's no investment, there is, say it with me. Where there's no investment, there's no love. Say it one more time. Where there's no investment, there is no love. Love is an investment. If I love you, I invest in you. That just doesn't mean money. It means time. It means appreciation. It means calling. It means texting you. It may, if I text you and you don't respond, I don't need to text you again because you could be on the toilet and text me back. The reality is, is love is an investment. It can't be my birthday every year. I buy you a gift, and on my birthday, you just tell me, happy birthday, player. Love you, bro. From my heart, I love you. No, love is an investment. I see my wife and her friends, they Christmas, they buy each other gifts, and, you know, men are not like that, but anyway. So, yeah, I saw them, I'm like, man, that, that's so cute, and that's so cool that you, you feel so indebted to your relationships. 
that you would make an investment in them so they can stay healthy. And some of us, the reason why our relationships are not healthy is because we don't invest in them. They're bankrupt. They're dying. They're struggling. And the only thing it needs is what? Investment. Don't tell me you love the church and never invest in it. Jesus says it this way. Where your treasure is, it's where your heart is. Okay? So now, now encouragement by giving a helping hand. Enlightenment. Encouragement by giving a helping hand. Empowerment. Empowerment. This is what we do. Encourage, enlighten, empower. That's all the three E's out of power. Encourage, enlighten, empower. Encourage, enlighten, empower. Encourage, enlighten, empower. Very clear. Enlightenment by spiritual things. Enlighten people spiritually. Encourage people by giving them a lending hand. That's what the church is going to do this year. Encourage people by giving them a lending hand. Every month, we're giving away $200 to families that are in need. Encouraging people by giving them a helping hand. Enlightening people spiritually. Empowering people economically. This is what the man did. You cannot help. That's why we have purpose nights. Because when you're in purpose, you can put somebody in a hotel room and tell the innkeeper, uh, I know they're, they're going to be here for a couple days. I'm going to take care of it. But you can't take care of people if you're not in the position to take care of people. So being blessed isn't just about you. It's about you being able to empower somebody. Like I love what Jermichael did. Graduate of college. Uh, was a college football player, didn't go to FSU, but maybe that's a whole other discussion. But he went to college, played college football, and he says, I'm an engineer or whatever, whatever you do, work for Procter & Gamble, uh, single too. Good job, good credit too. And all of a sudden, he, 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 says, he says, I want to do a college scholarship for youth. I want to give away some money to youth because I want to pay it forward. Some of you haven't paid anything forward. If you don't give to the church, can you give to an HBCU? Can we pay it forward to where we empower? Some of us are so blessed, but nobody's eating from our table but us. It is a joy for me to say, I have a partner of mine, we, we work together. She's made a whole lot of money off of me this year. And I'm so happy about it. Because it shouldn't only be you eating at the table. If you're the one always eating, you're the worst taskmaster there is. You may not be a believer in slaves, but you treat people around you like they are in slavery. We should empower people to get their own. Empower people to get forward in their lives. And he says, listen, I, I, know, I know he may not be able to pay you, but I'm going to stand and take care of it for him. I want to ask you a question. Out of all your goals this year, were they all about you? Or did you have a place for other people? I I'm trying to grind, get my... God will never bless your business to the degree that you wanted to be blessed because all you think about is feeding yourself. You don't even think about your employees. You don't even think about your staff. You don't even think about the people that God's going to call to you that you're going to provide a living to, but all you care about is what you drive and what you wear while they struggle watching you prosper. And you wonder why you have haters. Because they know if you eat, you'll watch them starve. So here's what I'm trying to tell you. We have to empower people to go to the next level. It doesn't mean that the man that was at the end will say thank you. It doesn't mean the man that you put on the end and you bandaged up and you washed up, you will appreciate you. But what I will tell you is he'll never forget you. And some of you are, man, I did some good things for people, and they treated me like a dog. You know what? They may have treated you like a dog, but I promise you, in the back of their hearts, they remember the good you did for them. And we cannot measure should we do good things to people based on their response towards us. If that was the case, then I wouldn't feed half my children. I don't cook, so I don't say so my wife wouldn't feed. Well, I put it on a plate for them, but I contribute somewhere. So here, here's the thing. This is what I'm saying. We cannot always wait for a thank you to step up and do something. Let Jesus be our rewarder and stop looking for everybody to repost what you did for them. For them to share what you impacted their lives. 
No, let God bless your life so that other people can look at your life and say, how did you get so bad? Well, I've been helping so many people and God has used my life as a sharing post to everybody else. You got a stage, give it away. Make people know who you're giving your stage to. I'm not just saying throw it up to anybody. But if you got influence, share it. If you go to jail, share your influence. Get me some commissary, bro. You know who the people in there. Get me some warm blankets if I get in trouble. Let me sleep in the cold. Share your influence. And God will bless you. And if a church is going to be a beacon of hill, a beacon light in the middle of Pine Hills, we've got to enlighten people spiritually. Because the God in their head is not the God in the Bible. We got to empower people. Because people's argument about the church is not that it doesn't save people. Their argument is it don't help people. And we got to encourage people. There's so much discouragement all around us. Let's be a place of encouragement. Bow your heads, let's pray. Father, we're setting the course for a new year. Asking you to lead and guide us so that we can do it well.